today. I'm very pleased to see so many people listening to our discussions today. As many of you hopefully listened to the previous discussion with Mark Carney, um, there is much to do and a real urgency, but also a real ability and real opportunity for us all to take action now and tackle uh, climate change. Um, as Mark has expressed on numerous occasions, every financial decision must take climate change into account. And we also are conscious that ESG and sustainability covers social and governance aspects. I'm looking forward to our panel discussion today. And let me first introduce myself. Um, I'm Adrian Sargent, I'm an ESG Treasury. We focus on helping companies transition to a sustainable economy. And previously, I spent many years in senior treasury positions in financial services. I'm privileged to be here with the panelists from a diverse cross section. We can hopefully share some light on the future of ESG and sustainability. We have three core questions we will cover before we uh, open up to questions from the audience. So there's a Q&A session here, so please submit your, uh, your questions as we go along. But just to give you some indication of what we're going to cover before I open up to questions then, we're doing why is ESG and sustainability important? With the world rightly focused on fighting COVID-19 and then rebuilding, how should we rebuild? And how do we ensure we keep ESG and sustainability as a primary focus? And then the last question we'll cover is, what are the important considerations for policymakers and central banks? And what is their role in ensuring we rebuild better? There's also the opportunities for you, the audience, to take part in two polls. The first of which we will open now, as I uh, then pass on to for the panelists to introduce themselves. The first poll we're going to open is, do you consider ESG factors in your treasury role or for those non-treasurers in your role in business today? Is that cash management, bond purchase investments, debt insurances, et cetera? So if you, uh, if you take part in that, we will bring that up once we've done the introduction. So um, without further ado, um, if I can ask Jessica, Ellen and Paul to introduce themselves, um, then over to yourselves. Um, so Jessica, first, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thanks a lot, Adrian, and it's great to be here today to share some of the insights. I am Jessica Fries, and I'm Exec Chair of the Prince of Wales's Accounting for Sustainability project. And we work with all parts of finance, so whether that's capital markets representatives or companies um, and regulators and, and others involved in, um, in the finance world, to look at how to embed sustainability into decision making. And one of our core networks is our CFO leadership network. And through that network, we've done a lot of work on debt finance, the role of treasurers. So that's really the, the area that I'm going to focus on in some of the insights that um, I hope I can share today. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Ellen, would you like to give a, a brief introduction? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Ellen Hughes-Cromwick. I'm currently a senior fellow at Third Way, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've got a long history in working in the private sector as chief global economist at Ford Motor Company. And then subsequent to that, I was chief economist at the U.S. Department of Commerce in the latter part of the Obama administration. I want to thank all the first responders out there. And if all of you on the call can turn around and hopefully thank someone who has been on the front line during COVID, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, and Paul. Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Paul LeCourcier. I'm the head of ESG research at Aviva Investors. So my team focuses on evaluating the companies that we invest in through an ESG lens. Um, so I'll naturally be bringing an investment and capital markets uh, perspective to the discussion that we're having today. And I'm also a board member on our Aviva Investors Liquidity Funds platform. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. So, so hopefully you see we've got quite a diverse but very knowledgeable and um, experienced panelist here as well. So um, without further ado, um, if we can bring up the poll um, so, so that people on the, on the call can, uh, can see that. Um, We've got a fairly balanced view there. So we've got 35, 36% mostly consider ESG factors, 43% sometimes, 14% rarely, and 7% never. So, you know, there are there are considerations there. It's uh, it's encouraging and positive to see that mostly and sometimes 
making the vast majority of these. Um, so that's actually great. Um, so you know, it shows that ESG and sustainability is in the is in the sort of general domain. Um, but Paul, um, could you just sort of lead off with your views about why is ESG and sustainability important? Yeah, of course. Um, obviously, there is a right thing to do angle, but I'm not going to come at the discussion from that direction because even if you imagine an individual that has zero altruism that individual should still be concerned about ESG and sustainability because it is impacting investment performance and it is impacting securities issuance. On the investment performance side of things, um, we completed a project at the end of last year that took a look at 10 years worth of financial markets data. And we evaluated the relationship between ESG metric performance and investment returns. And we found a couple of key things in that study. The first one is that after you control for the key aspects of systematic risk to make sure that you're not confusing ESG with country industry and things like that, we did find within each industry that there was a significant and positive relationship between ESG performance and financial performance. In other words, the better a firm is doing on sustainability, on average, the better their financial returns were. And I think it's important to recognize how big of a shift that is compared to an assumption that the market might have made five or 10 years ago. I think historically ethical investing or sustainability investing would have been viewed as a direct trade-off. In other words, if you're prioritizing that, you're, you're by definition giving up financial returns. And, and that has absolutely changed. We've found very clear evidence to the contrary. The second key point is that the magnitude of the relationship appears to be increasing over time, i.e. sustainability and ESG is becoming more important. Um, that's very intuitive to me. You heard Mark talk quite a bit about the increased focus on disclosure and transparency. Once you start disclosing something and reporting on it, it feeds into the investment process and by definition, it will impact asset valuations. And then briefly on the securities issuance points, um, it's expanding the types of bonds that investors can invest in. There was a sell side report that was released last month that stated that ESG bond issuance is up 300% year over year. Some of those bonds will have sustainability criteria attached to the use of the proceeds. Others will have coupon payments or yields that are contingent upon the issuer's performance on sustainability points. And so it's expanding the flexibility that you have as an investor to prioritize ESG and sustainability. So to go back to that individual that has zero altruism, they still should care very much about this because it is impacting the financial markets and, train, and changing how things operate. Excellent. So, uh, so that's very encouraging to hear and the, you know, the increase in the bond market, the diversity there as well. Um, Alan, I wonder if you've got any views that you'd like to share there. Yeah, great. Thank you. I wanted to uh, talk to the audience a bit about what is happening in the transportation sector. You may be aware that transportation is the largest contributor to CO2 emissions at present. In the U.S., it's just a little bit under 30 percent. And therefore, transportation has a very large role to play in achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And in that regard, we've seen a lot of positive developments in the private sector. I wanted to mention in particular the way that battery economics has now helped to facilitate the transition toward battery electric vehicles. You may be aware that we've had almost 100% decline in the cost of a battery pack in the last 10 years. And now the proposition is so much different than what we saw during and after the global financial crisis in that this technology advancement has now laid the groundwork for a transition. If you go into any assembly plant today and as a treasurer or CFO, you want to convert that to the production of battery electric vehicles, you know, that plant uh, footprint uh, for EVs is only half of what a conventional gasoline or diesel powered vehicle footprint is. And therefore, there's a lot of capital that's going to need to go into this transition. And someone mentioned, I think it was uh, former Governor Carney, 
uh, that the market cap of Tesla it well exceeds many of our conventional automotive companies globally. I think that's an important point. I think that treasurers and CFOs are going to help to drive a strategic plan that will offer up more value as the companies move toward electric vehicles. So I, I hope all of you can go back to your respective places and think it's not just the auto companies, the supply chains for transportation are absolutely huge. In the US, there are 7 million workers that are either at automotive companies or related in terms of supply chain to automotive. So there's a very large, you know, kind of ecosystem that can transition to electrified transportation. And here's my modeling. Um, what it shows in a scenario is that we have to get to 100% electric vehicles battery electric vehicles by 2035 in order to have a turnover in the fleet to get to net zero by 2050. So I'm hoping that as we see this play out that more and more companies start to look at a strategic plan that achieves that. And I think it's very doable given the technology innovations. Excellent. So, so it comes to something that we heard from Mark Carney about uh, those treasurers or those people that aren't CEOs on the call, ask your CEO what the strategy is to net or negative zero, uh, no matter what industry. And so, uh, Jessica, I wonder if you've got a, a few thoughts on, on why, why it's important, and then I'll come to you for the next question as well. Sure. Thanks a lot, Adrian. And so if I think of the work that we have done with the, um, the CFO and Treasury community, as well as with investors, I think, as, as, as both Paul and Ellen have highlighted, um, sustainable business, so environmental and social risk and opportunity are topics that are of relevance to every organisation. Um, there are significant risks, as we are sadly seeing playing out at the moment, um, but also opportunities. And those risks and opportunities need finance um, to help mitigate or realise. And so I think that there are, there are a lot of opportunities for treasurers to be looking across the, the different risks and opportunities that their organization might be facing and really thinking through how can they be positioning themselves to take advantage of those opportunities um, and how can they respond to the risk. We see consistently um, opportunities to, to the cost savings associated with embedding sustainability ESG. We see um, opportunities to be driving innovation. Um, we see opportunities also to be engaging um, teams, customers, suppliers. And I think if you look through to some of the, the trends that we're seeing playing out at the moment, a lot of these same factors are playing out now. So, so um, Paul mentioned there's, there's research going back historically to say that companies with good ESG performance um, are, um, are, are frequently more resilient, frequently um, stronger in terms of their financial performance. Um, you're also seeing that in the last few months as well. So there's quite interesting analysis um, on that front that says even, even in the current crisis, those who really have that kind of integrated approach and are trying to build into the business model and into their decision making are the ones that are um, more resilient in the country. Excellent. So, so I mean, there's, there's a lot there. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's things from Paul about um, performance and um, resilience um, from yourself and from Ellen as well. So, you know, the, the strategy of, of all corporates and financials should, should change. It should be beneficial and the opportunities are there as well. So, uh, so you know, that's encouraging to hear. And if we just move on to the next question then. So I was going to ask you, with the world rightly focused on fighting COVID-19 and then rebuilding. Um, we've heard the hashtag build back better a number of times as well. Um, how should we rebuild? And how do we ensure we keep ESG and sustainability as a primary focus? And, and Jessica, look, be useful to, to go to yourself because uh, you know, in your um, sort of podcast, mini podcast with Caroline that, that I sort of saw earlier as well, um, we've got a publication out there um, recently as well, but just over to you for some, some thoughts there. 
Yeah, and so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of the recent work we've done, which um, ACT has, has kind of supported and contributed to based on the work that we've done with Treasury teams from across our global CFO network. Um, but thinking specifically in terms of the, the response to the pandemic, what we've seen from, from all of the companies globally that we've been working with is, of course, that um, near term response and a real focus on, on people at the heart of that response. So whether that is um, how to support employees in the, in the near term, um, suppliers changing terms, supplier terms, um, from the banking community, again, thinking about different kinds of um, support that can be provided there. Um, and of course, to, to support communities and, and society as a whole to tackle the pandemic. What we also see is that there are um, opportunities linked to that Build Back Better. And I think that, that Mark Carnley underlined that we see some um, some significant risks coming through from something like the climate crisis and a lot of focus amongst investors and governments in thinking through how do we respond and of course from the corporate community and I think there are some real opportunities to to take some of those near-term actions that everyone is having to really focus on to get through um, the current crisis and think through how some of those themes might support building back better and and we have really seen that that shift coming through to a genuinely stakeholder mindset and really thinking about those broader impacts um, and how working in a more collaborative way, focusing on the things that really matter and driving through innovation, through new partnerships, as well as the need to really understand global supply chains, global value chains, some of the vulnerabilities, but also the opportunities to be enhancing resilience. And that does link through to some of the social and environmental dimensions as well. If I think of the a, a good starting point for treasury teams to be thinking about um, is around a sustainable finance framework. So we, we um, released a guide last year on um, an essential guide to debt finance. So looking at how you can embed ESG into all activities that treasury teams undertake. And this top tips guide around a sustainable finance framework is, is a good place to start. So it really sets out how treasury teams can think about the interest that there is in the market. Um, and as I say, there's been strong demand recently around social bonds, but continued um, interest in, in green bond market as well. Um, as well as how an organization embeds ESG across all of their um, strategy and, and, and financing activities. And we see a sustainable finance framework as a good place to start really putting in place the basic building blocks, making sure that you're equipped to go to the market. And um, Mark Carney highlighted that um, some governments have started to think through how might economic stimuli be linked to action in these sorts of areas. So the, the, the Canadian government um, looking at TCFD requirements. I have heard some banks talking about how they might maybe as a carrot rather than a stick, but think about um, ESG performance criteria linked to lending. And certainly pre, pre the, um, the pandemic, we had seen quite a lot of organizations thinking about things like revolving credit facilities and getting preferential terms linked to ESG performance KPI. So I think that there's a lot of scope to be thinking about both in terms of issuance um, of debt, but also in terms of some of the facilities that might be on offer. And I do think that now continues to be um, a good time to be thinking about those issues, if not even, even more so, um, because the response has really, um, I think, deepened everyone's sense of the need that we are all in this together. We do need to act collectively, um, both to tackle some of the financial consequences, but also as a society to, to come out of, um, of the current crisis and respond to ones that we know are coming down the line. Yeah, there's some very, very key points there as well. I mean, I, I've been heartened by the, the collective response to COVID-19. And, you know, that's, that's an element that um, demonstrates that we as a world can get through difficult um, items. And so therefore, ESG, climate change and the like, um, we can tackle it. It's just that we have to start 
when we have to all work together. Um, Paul, do you have any comments on that about, um, you know, how do we ensure we keep ESG and sustainable as a primary focus? I mean, Jessica mentioned differential in pricing. Um, I've seen that certainly in some of, some of the research and some of the correspondence I've, I've been involved in. Um, Paul, any comments? Yeah, yeah, just briefly. I mean, as an investor, one avenue we have is that we have access to the management teams for the companies that we invest in. And I mean, if you went to a CEO in the thick of this crisis where he's trying to manage his firm's solvency, you might get a bit of an awkward response if you tried to bring up their continuing commitment to sustainability and avoiding climate change. But one thing that we definitely try to remind them is that when we get to the other side of this crisis, the market will definitely view companies favorably if they haven't dropped the ball on their sustainability initiative simply because if the company does drop the ball, it exposes them to controversy risks and we see those risks as significant. So we, we try to remind them that we are watching them effectively. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. Um, Manella, any comments? Because what we, if you can sort of pass some comments on there, then what we'll do, we'll, I'll come to you with, uh, with the final question before we open the floor up. So uh, for yourself about what we can do to ensure ESG and sustainability remains a primary focus. Yes, and I think that, you know, we're going to be going through several stages as we get to recovery post-COVID. You know, we've had rescue packages. Uh, you know, you've had them in, in Europe. We've had them in the U.S. and many of the other countries. Now we're moving to relief to help both companies and people, given that uh, this morning, for example, we had nearly 2 million more people file for unemployment insurance in the US. We're now almost 35 million people who have filed for unemployment insurance in the last seven weeks. And therefore we need relief and we focus directly on that. But now let's think about recovery. And that's where I think green bonds and also, we're seeing renewable energy ETFs outperform conventional energy ETFs. You know, there's a momentum there. And I think as we think about relief, um, you know, there's a lot of potential whereby the government with many different loan facilities can partner with investors to pro offer up uh, paper securities that will finance this transition. And I think given that central banks have, for the most part, our major, major central banks have taken interest rates to either zero or below, that the cost of capital base upon which pricing for green bonds would happen, that, that we're in a very opportunistic period. And now is the time where I think the volume around green bonds, I mean, for example, you see what BlackRock is doing with their green bond fund. So the metrics for proceeds from the bonds uh, are there, they're outlined rather clearly. And that architecture underneath the um, market has improved substantially. So we're really teed up for a recovery and growth in capital flowing toward decarbonization efforts globally. So we're opportunistic right now. And I think investors really hold the keys to help companies move in that direction. Excellent, excellent. So, so it's all for um, treasurers, companies, CEOs, chairs to, to, to grasp it look at the future uh, and all the, the mechanism is, is there and ready to go. Um, great to hear. So before we go into the final question, before we open up to questions from the audience, and if we could open the poll up for, for those, uh, those participating. So next poll is, do you expect your focus on ESG and sustainability to increase over the next 12 months? Um, and then Ellen, whilst that poll's coming in, if we can, uh, we can talk about the, the third question, um, so given, I know you've had some experience with central banks and the Fed, so I thought it would be worthwhile getting your views on this as well, is what are the important considerations for policymakers and central banks and what is their role in ensuring we rebuild better? So, Alan, over to you. 
Great question. And, uh, you know, the major global central banks have signed up to the network for greening the financial system. I think one of the most important developments has been the task, task force for climate related financial disclosure. And, oh, I mean, we need that desperately. If any of you just take a look at the latest uh, you know, 10K or 10Q, uh, at least in the U.S., where you can see kind of, you know, some qualitative and maybe to some extent some quantitative assessment of climate risks. We just need a standard. We need to get so investors know in a transparent way what are the climate risks? How much are they? And once we have that, then investors can vote with their feet you know, they'll be able to activate that. So we're on the cusp of that development. I think that's going to be a big game changer. Excellent, excellent. Um, and Jessica, I mean, you, you're involved in various different um, global aspects as well. What are your views on, uh, you know, policymaker considerations and, and central bank's roles? I, as, as Ellen mentioned, I think one of the strongest indicators of that is the network for greening the financial system. And, and what you're seeing is central banks around the world really getting together, focused on um, sharing understanding around some of the risks, around some of the policy responses and a, a very strong push around the TCFD disclosure requirements. Um, and 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 thinking about the implications of that from a policy perspective. So if I just look at the, the UK market, what you've seen is, um, is the banking regulators really starting to put in place a framework that requires governance um, around particularly, particularly climate, but I think that that then broadens out into an understanding of some of the, the other ESG related risks. So a need to have um, somebody at that board level with direct accountability um, flowing through then into an understanding of how the organization is analyzing some of the risks arising as part of lending activities. And of course, working with some of the banks that we do, one of the key things that they need both to be able to do their own TCFD reporting, which is increasingly um, becoming mandatory, uh, mm -hmm seen investors starting to um, vote. So I, I would almost call that a, a, a soft requirement. So um, you, you probably need to do it, whether it's in, in the strict sense required or not, um, but also increasingly regulators moving towards mandatory reporting in this area. And so you're, you're seeing some very strong pulls. And of course, whether it's banks or um, asset managers and, and asset owners, so if I think of the pension funds we're working with, who are needing that kind of information on performance to be able to analyze their own books and their own investments to understand um, the, 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 the future performance of those assets. And so I think that it is something that you're, it will increasingly become the norm. You're seeing strong regulatory drivers around that. Um, and I do think that those drivers, coming back to the previous discussion, won't just be on climate, but will be looking at some of the social drivers as well that we're seeing front of mind as we try and respond to the, to the current pandemic. Um, and, the, and the human impacts of that. And I do think that there are opportunities for strong, um, positive co-benefit. So around creating jobs, around creating resilient, um, resilient business as we come out of this that can help to tackle something like climate change too. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and Paul, from, from Aviva's perspective and, and investment side of things, are, are you, uh, engaged or, or seeing anything as far as policymakers and central banks um, or is there also the element there of investors um, moving with their feet and either voting or or sort of campaigning for, for, for these elements? Yeah so while, while both avenues are definitely important I really don't think we should underestimate how key the regulatory role is 
And to make that come to life a little bit, let's just talk through a, a quick hypothetical example. So let, let's assume that as a group, our goal is to reduce the climate change impact of a particular industry that is quite carbon intensive. Um, on the investor engagement side of things, as I said before, I have access to the company management team. So I could meet with all of the CEOs involved and I could apply pressure on them to change their practices, put more aggressive reduction targets in place. And the threat that I've got, as you said, is either divestment, you know, taking my capital elsewhere, or if I'm not satisfied with what they're doing and I'm an equity investor, I can start voting against the resolutions as they come up, you know, through the AGM cycle. That's really the stick that I'm carrying. If you compare that to what a regulator could accomplish, in theory, a regulator could impose a draconian carbon tax. Not saying that they will, but they could. You know, that is an option that is on the table if they weren't seeing progress that they, they found satisfying. Now, while I can be pretty convincing in a meeting room, I think we have to accept that I'm carrying a much smaller stick compared to the one that the regulator is carrying. And so while both are important, I see the regulators as playing a critical and key role in taking this forward. Excellent, excellent. No, uh, I, I, so, and I think I, I tend to agree as well that the regulators need to need to put the framework in place um, for others to follow as well, um, make it consistent. So. Um, just with the poll then, so the people have been voting whilst we've been discussing that, and the poll is in as far as um, the change in focus. So we've got 64% are saying that they'll definitely change focus and um, it will increase over the next 12 months. 14% um, probably, 14% possibly, uh, and and and, uh, and a small amount unlikely. So, uh, so you know, that's uh, of those that have voted, then uh, definitely uh, moving in the right direction. And we've got a number of, of questions that have now came in. So... Um, there's, from looking through them, there's a couple of or two, two, two or three themes that are that are coming out. Um, so, given that the audience here are sort of treasurers, um, many corporate treasurers here, um, there's a couple of points here about money market funds. Um, so, you know, is there an ESG money market fund? If not, when will we see one? Um, and when will the ESG money market fund be large enough for treasurers to hold ESG only investment portfolios? Um, so, Paul, I wonder if that's one that uh, you've got some insight to. Yeah, I think there are a couple of angles um, through which we can approach this. I mean, our approach to ESG is that we integrate it into all of our investments decisions. So even if a money market fund doesn't have an SRI label attached to it, um, you should expect your asset manager to be incorporating ESG into the decisions that they make. On the labeling side of things, we do expect to see more products and more funds available that do have an explicit ethical or ESG label or focus to them where ESG is the point. It's clearly labeled on the tin. You know exactly what you're getting and what the criteria are for inclusion in that portfolio versus exclusion. So there are two ways to think about it, and I think they're both important. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Jessica, Ellen, do, do either of you have any comments on that particular one? Uh, no, I don't have a direct comment, but I do want to emphasize that the breadth and depth of the markets for these kinds of investments is growing substantially. And green bonds last year, I think globally were uh, just under 300 billion. I know that sounds small compared to the total uh, global bond market. But this, th these products are growing, and I would offer up that you know, any anybody can go out there and find a structure and an asset allocation that'll um, be very pleasing in this regard. Yeah. Um, just one, sorry, one, one, one point just to add around this that I think is um, is really important that, and this applies to all all types of funds, not just money market funds is that there is a need for more consistent labeling. You're seeing some of that coming through from Europe at the moment. But if I think of a lot of the, um, also the pension funds that we work with, so we have a network of pension fund chairs. And one of the things that they really struggle with is knowing what good is, how, what kind of impact is a particular fund really having? Because you are getting more and more funds that have different um, green environment, social, ESG, sustainable development goal. There's a whole different suite of funds emerging and different terms that are being used and applied. And often they mean very different things. So 
um, more consistency in those labeling, I think is really important, more consistent definitions and, and application of those definitions. Um, one thing that we are doing with that asset owners network is some work to look across the different kinds of um, asset classes and particularly outside equity, because I think there's a lot more that has been done in equity, but whether it is around fixed income, around money market, around um, infrastructure, to look at that question of what good looks like. And certainly we'd be very happy to share that with, with anyone here from the treasury community who would be um, interested as that comes through. Excellent, thank you, Jessica. Um, and I mean, linking to that as well, there's uh, there's a couple of um, comments here about the EU taxonomy, but also linking to the standards and, and probably some of the definitions that you alluded to um, just earlier there, Jessica. So, you know, there's, there's, there's one question here. How do investors and citizens genuinely make fair comparisons between companies and investment products? And that's referring to the thousands of standards uh, and those other, other items. I mean, is it a case that with the EU taxonomy, people need to wait for that to be adopted, and that's going to be the, the golden source. Or is there is there anything else um, that perhaps you, yourself, Jessica, have, have seen in in those discussions, and then possibly come to Paul as well for some comments on that? And mm -hmm. um, maybe if I start, I've already touched on the EU taxonomy, and I do think that that is a very important um, factor, or have, having. Um, consistent definitions in that space. When it comes to the, the broader standards, so the reporting standards, I would say that there is a huge amount of convergence happening there. So what on the surface can look like a very fragmented picture, um, when you start to peel back the layers, there is a lot of convergence. And I would say that over the next 12 months, you will see some big steps forward in terms of having international standards around some of the environmental, social, sustainability information set. Um, I think you're seeing collaboration and convergence both by, by the standard setting organisations to get to that point, um, and from a lot of the organisations that have a, a key stake. So whether that is the businesses who are being asked to report all of this information, whether it is the, um, the investors using it, the regulators um, who are getting a, a clear push from the market, but also from the wider stakeholder community. So I would, um, I would say, do what you can to support that convergence. I think it will make everyone's life easier. Not everyone will be happy with the answer. And that's why I think you get a proliferation in different types of funds and in different types of reporting standards because everyone wants something and sees something slightly different as important. And, and just on that, I do think that there is an important role for technology that can also help to provide that individual tailoring within um, a more coherent underlying um, information base. And I think that then coming back to the role of regulator, you are seeing, um, for example, the IOSCO, International Organization of Security Commissions, um, working with some of the, the global standard setters as well. And I think that that's where you're also seeing that drive towards mandatory, not just around something like TCFD, but around the rep broader reporting that, that underpins a lot of the, um, therefore, the, the, the definitions that might be used in practice. No, thank you, Jessica. And uh, and Paul, sort of from the investor side of things as well. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a concern of the someone who's not perhaps doing this day in day out that there's there's obviously lots of different standards and lots of different different items there. How how do you navigate that, or what advice would you give to to those on on the call today? Yeah, I'm I'm very empathetic to this conundrum. Um, it's something that we face on a day in and day out basis, and. One thing that the disclosure and transparency efforts have delivered thus far is a wonderful increase in awareness. But to date, they still leave quite a bit of discretion in terms of how the companies or issuers present themselves, present their sustainability performance. And that makes it very difficult to look from one company to the next on an apples to apples basis. Just as a quick example of that, something as simple as carbon intensity, even within the same industry group, it's often reported in different ways from one company to the next. It will be 
per unit of floor space. It will be per mass of, of product that's actually distributed. And you have to find some other way to normalize it uh, to be able to rank companies in terms of how they're doing. Um, we do hope that the EU taxonomy will become something like the gold standard. It won't be perfect, but it will at least be a standard that everyone can talk using the same language. And we hope that that does make the situation more comparable. I mean, I guess one thing that we've found necessary that I think everyone needs to realize is part of the exercise at this point is getting a clear set of information through one data provider or one software package at this point just isn't possible. You have to have the patience to compile pieces of information from different sources to paint a holistic picture. And at this point, that's what we're dealing with. But we do hope the standards and transparency will become more consistent going forward. And uh, Anel, is there anything you're seeing from your involvement on, in, in the US and, and obviously this uh, myriad of different different ratings and, and, and uh, frameworks that's available there? <laughs> It's the wild, wild west. I, I completely agree with what Paul and Jessica have uh, have mentioned. I don't have much to add. I know it's a very complex, you know, set of metrics. And, you know, frankly, that's scaring off a, a, some participation. To be brutally honest, you know, when a CFO looks at some of this, they just are you know, thinking, well, this, you know, this is just really challenging. But, you know, once companies start to dig into it and recognize they're looking for results and they're not going to do something that isn't going to generate a result in this direction, especially decarbonization. So I think it's just a question of, you know, starting to work through it. Yes, we'd love to have a standard uh, you know, that's available and we can plug in an AI or an algorithm and, you know, use blockchain and everything will be swimming, you know, at some point. But right now, you know, companies are working through this and the ones that recognize that that decarbonization is going to add value. Once they see that uh, landscape, you know, there's really no turning back. So I think it's happening, but it is the wild, wild west. I think we've uh, we've we've covered covered quite a quite a bit. Um, we've got a few a few minutes left. So there's there's um, there's there's one or two questions coming through that perhaps we can sort of integrate into some some closing remarks if uh, if that's if that's appropriate. And we can sort of do a do a minute a minute each on 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 a couple of you know what what would you what would you say treasurers and participants should take away from away from this. Um, there's one question here on how do we focus on E versus S changing and what will be the key driver. So there's, there's an interesting one there about, you know, the balance between E, S and G. And, you know, is one more important than the other? It is often a conversation point. Um, and how do you get everything aligned? Um, but if I just go around quickly, I think if, if, if we could just have a couple of final thoughts um, before we close off and then I can and then I can wrap up. Um, so, Paul, do you want to sort of kick off with a couple of thoughts for a, for a minute or so? Yeah, just one thing I wanted to highlight towards the end is obviously um, this is becoming a central topic on, on many, many forums. Um, it, it's something that the entire market is starting to talk more about. We haven't really discussed much the topic of greenwashing, you know, this notion where an issuer or an asset manager will say that they take this into consideration, um, but they really don't. They really don't take it that seriously. Um, I, I'd encourage everyone on the line to just keep that in mind as this becomes more and more important across asset management products and securities that you can invest in. And to make sure that when you're evaluating either an issuer to invest in directly, or if you're evaluating an asset manager, to make sure that you are demanding the proof points so that they are genuinely integrating it, because otherwise you'll be leaving investment performance on the table. Back to the, the comments that we made toward the beginning. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Um, Ellen, do you have any final final comments as well? Yeah, I guess, you know, my phrase is ignore it at your peril. You know, I mean, this is happening. And I think that the private sector and the capital markets are really going to get out in front on this. I mean, there's not, we're not going back to where we were. And in fact, you know, this crisis of COVID, the health crisis, has really highlighted a lot of the kind of equity issues. Um, you know, we saw in our labor market here, people 
that are on the edge are getting hurt more than others. And they, oh, by the way, are hurt more by climate change. So it's happening, you know, the capital markets and participants are gonna see the value of moving more toward uh, the E and the S and the G over time. So it's just get on the bandwagon because if you ignore it, you're gonna lose value over time. Excellent, thank you, Ellen. And, and Jessica, a couple of comments from yourself. I don't think you can split the E and the S. So I think for, for me, I would say, think about where your organization has the biggest opportunity to have positive impact, where you have dependencies. And really, climate has to be one of the things that you think about, but not the only. Um, if we're going to get to net zero, that really is a transformation of the whole economy. So there's very few whether it's the social factors that might play through from a failure to respond or the actions that are needed, the investments that are needed to try and mitigate um, the worst effects of, of, of a changing climate. Um, but, but really think through what you can do. And maybe if I just recap from our recent top tips, um, the first is just getting started. I think once you've started, you can test and refine, you can look at how to implement, you can build more momentum, you can then revisit, enhance, expand, but it is really about taking action and taking action now. Excellent. Well, um, that just leads me to conclude and, and thank you very much, all three of you, for, for your time um, and your insights. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's one question about more information from the panellists and, and the like. So, you know, there's there's I'm sure everyone's on, on LinkedIn and there's also various um, publications and Jessica's alluded to to the one for accounting for sustainability that was done um, alongside the Association of Corporate Treasurers. And um, thank you Aviva for sponsoring this as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the overarching uh, item is um, don't ignore it, get on the bandwagon and it'll be positive. It'll have a positive impact on the company, a positive impact on the returns and ultimately a positive impact on your career and the um, and the whole climate and the world. So um, just going to say thank you very much and uh, thank you for participating as well. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you.